Uh, my name is Christian, I work as a kernel engineer at the Lexi and Lexi team. I'm one of the core maintainers for it as well. Um, right, uh, and I'm going to be talking about interesting kernel container work that has happened in the last year. Uh, and also going to touch on some stuff that we're going to work on, uh, that is planned to be worked on, let's put it like this. Um, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening, um, and I'm not going to be able to talk about all of it, just because it's so much. Uh, and I originally hoped to go into a lot more detail in various, on various patch sets and also do some demos. But timing-wise, this is going to be a problem in 30 minutes. But we'll see how, how deep we can actually look into various features and so on. Um, right. So the first thing, so basically I start from kernel 4.15, right? Uh, that's the last, one of the first kernels that got released in 2018, I think. Um, so uh, users, a use case we had for a long time with system containers, Lexi and Lexi, is often users want to mount uh, specific directories into their containers. So we allow for mount hot plugging. So users at runtime can inject a new mount into a container. So say they want to mount their home directories, right? Um, and we run unprivileged containers by default, which means you specify an ID mapping, and that ID mapping will usually block you from actually writing to the directory you just mounted into the container, and you probably don't want to churn recursively directory, uh, recursively through your home directory. So one of the solutions that users usually came up with and what we supported was um, punch a hole in the ID mapping. Basically say, uh, my own user ID, uh, which is 1000, I'm going to map this through. So the UID 1000 inside of the container is the exact same meaning as UID 1000 outside of the container. If you do that, you can write to your home directory. Uh, turns out users want to, uh, if, especially if they share system containers or a container, they want to have multiple directories with different UIDs in the container. So uh, they want to punch through multiple maps, uh, multiple holes into the AD mapping. Um, and the kernel for a long time had a limit which was set to five. Uh, so you could only have five ID mappings. Um, and the reason for that was, does anyone know? Well, performance, actually. One of the uh, destruct that was chosen inside of the kernel to do this was exactly one cache line, or limited to a maximum one size of a cache line. So when the kernel performs lookups, for example, uh, when it tries to determine, can I write to a specific directory, the kernel tries to look up, does this UID uh, have a mapping inside of the user namespace? This write is going to happen. Or the kernel also performed, depending on what it wanted to do, lookups uh, the other way around. Uh, and this needs to be very performant, so, um, so that you don't get, for example, problems with cache eviction and so on. So the struct size was actually chosen in a way that it hold, uh, held exactly five mappings. So what we needed to do, <laughs> we wanted to bump this limit significantly. Originally we thought like 10 should be enough, and then people came up with, oh no, we have like 100 UIDs or whatever, we need to map through, and we're like, oh, great. Um, and obviously we, 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 I wrote a first version of the patch, uh, that just bumped the limit as high as, as possibly could, and it was like I think 340 is is the limit. Uh, after that, it gets really tricky with cache line sizes and so on. Um, so we had the task of using five, going over five mappings, and making uh, it as performant as possible without regressing the base cases, which means zero mappings, so you have no UAD mappings at all, and up to five mappings, so it should be exactly the same type of performance. So what we do, uh, we did to make this happen. A bunch of smart people obviously thought about this. Um, I'm not smart enough for this. Joking. But um, <laughs> we had, uh, so you see the struct UID GID uh, map, and inside there is a substruct UID GID extent T, and extent in this case just means a single ID mapping. Um, and what we did is we chose the struct, we put a union in the struct, so you see the U32, that means number of extents, all of the extents that you specified, that's the number of mappings you have. Um, and then if you have the five base cases, uh, then you can use the struct array, struct UID, GID, extent, extent, UID, GID, map, max, extents. Uh, so for five mappings, nothing really changes, it's the same type of performance. Um, and if you go over five mappings, then we have a forward and a reverse pointer. <laughs> and what it basically does, it points to a struct, uh, it points to a pointer of uh, UID, UID maps, UID, GID maps. 
and uh, they are sorted in different ways. They are either sorted by the user namespace ID inside of the user namespace or the ID as seen from the ancestor UID GID namespace. And so when the kernel performs a lookup, it can use binary search on those pointers uh, depending on in which direction it, look up, it looks up. Uh, and this is actually pretty performant, uh, turns out. So we ran the numbers. And if you want to see uh, how you can write a really shitty patch, then you look at version uh, v1, which was my first patch. And you scale like zero mappings up to 340 mappings that you can specify. And you see that was a great idea, right? So the test that we performed is we created one million files um, and uh, made sure that they were in the cache and then started each of those files a bunch of times and then calculated the mean, uh, uh, the mean stat time for each of those files. Uh, and here you can see what, what the mean stat time for, for uh, one million files is. Uh, it's 158 nanoseconds for zero mappings, which is the same for both patch sets. And then if you scale linearly, you end up with something like 2,760 nanoseconds when you go to 300, 300 mappings. And if the, uh, the algorithm we came up with in the end, the, the one you saw before, you end up with 248 nanoseconds. That's like not even 100 nanoseconds. Uh, that you get slapped with when you use 340 mapping. So that's pretty good. Um, so yeah, uh, this problem, we're still working on this problem to some extent because um, this is a stopgap measure. The correct solution would be something like ShiftFS, uh, which another team member of mine has, uh, has worked on. It's uh, in good shape. Well, it's actually ready. Um, sort of, right? Um, so once we have shift, shift FS, which I'm, not, which I'm not going to touch on now, this is all not going to be a problem anymore. But right now, if you need to map through specific UIDs and GIDs, this is the way to go, and you can do it up to 340 uh, mappings now. Um, right. I mean, this is something you probably have heard of, right? Uh, unprivileged mounts in user namespaces. Who has heard of this? Ah, a few at least have. Uh, this is this is a work that has been uh, going on for a long time. It has been done by a lot, a lot of people, a lot of different people, uh, spearheaded by Eric Biederman from Red Hat, and uh, Seth Forshi has done a lot of work uh, on my team on this as well. And this is like a multi-year effort. This is not just something that landed in one kernel. There's a lot of, oh, by the way, I should have mentioned this. These are all Git comet hashes you can use when I put up the slides to look the comets up in the Linux kernel tree, so you don't have to search through the whole tree for the comets that I'm actually talking about. Um, which you might find helpful or not. Um, and this is actually interesting work. You can mount a bunch of pseudo file system right now in user namespaces, right? You can mount def tempfs, uh, uh, no, not def tempfs. That's definitely not possible. Def pts and uh, tempfs uh, and a bunch of others. And these are interesting file systems. Well, the file systems you need, but not really very interesting file systems. What users really actually care about is mounting proper block-based file system, right? So X4, XFS, whatever it is. Um, and uh, this has been a long-standing request. The problem is you, well, you face problems on two fronts. Security in the VFS and security from the individual file system that you are talking about. So the first step that needed to happen is make the VFS itself safe uh, when mounting uh, file systems user namespaces. That included work like, for example, tracking the user namespace uh, the file system was mounted in, uh, in the super block. Stuff like dealing with device node creation, uh, like, for example, when you are able to mount the file system inside of a user namespace, uh, you immediately become privileged with respect to that file system, which means you can make not in that file system all you want. Obviously, inside of user namespace, trivial attack you can come up with, make not def kmem, if that's enabled in your kernel, and then write to random kernel memory, kernel crash. So that's probably not a good idea. So you need to come up with a way to actually block uh, um, unprivileged users from messing with your file system. Um, then there was a X adders, unprivileged uh, file system attributes, extended attributes. Uh, this is work that has been done by Serge Hallens to user namespace file system attributes so you can use them uh, instead of user namespaces. Uh, but even if you go through all of that and you make the VFS itself safe, which is what all of these patches or most of these patches did, so from the VFS perspective, uh, it's fine now. Oh, does anyone, everybody know what the VFS is? Okay, good. Um, and uh, now you have an additional problem. Uh, the VFS might say it's totally fine from our perspective uh, you can go ahead 
uh, and run and mount file systems inside user namespaces. Now you have an additional problem that VFS security is independent of file system security. So a specific file system maintainer must be willing to essentially say, I can guarantee uh, that in the face of a corrupt file system image or in the face of a corrupt image, it's still totally fine uh, to mount this inside of a user namespace. The kernel is still safe. And that's a guarantee that I'm pretty sure not a lot of file system maintainers want to, uh, want to, actually, want to actually give, which is reasonable. Um, because file systems actually were never, in, I, I think, never designed with unprivileged users in, in mind or user namespaces in mind. So the attack that I'm thinking of is essentially if you are able to mount a random image that somebody gives you inside of a user namespace and the, the one he corrupts, he or she corrupts the super block and then you mount it, kind of crash. So that's a huge attack surface. Um, the only file systems that really... Um, uh, possible to be mounted inside of user namespaces as of now is Fuse. That's a recent addition in 4.18. And there is talk about making it possible for overlay FS. Uh, there are patches for this, and, uh, but they haven't been upstreamed yet. And I don't know how comfortable the overlay FS maintainers at this point would feel with making overlay FS inside of user namespaces possible. But it's definitely one of those file systems that, that could be a good candidate. For the other, it's, it's probably very, very unlikely that it's ever going to happen, to be honest. Um, I would conjecture. Uh, the kernel regression bit is kind of interesting. There is a basically we regress user space with this at some point uh, by making make not possible inside of user namespaces. Um, this is reverted now, and I don't have time to go into this. But yeah, it was an interesting uh, interesting thing that happened this year. Um, the next piece is something that Leonard always hates me for. Uh, <laughs> no, joking. Um, so. Device management in Linux is split between user space and kernel space, right? So the kernel uh, actually on a, a newer Linux kernel creates device nodes inside of devtempfs, uh, and udev triggers some bunch of rules to do static naming of devices and so on, all that kind of cra uh, stuff. <clears throat> and um, well, I don't know, this is fast, and I'm aware allowed to swear, right? <laughs> and uh, so uh, user namespace runs the UDEF daemon, exactly. So in the glue between these two, th two events is essentially a U events, meaning a kernel creates a device node, a kernel sends out a U event, based on that U event, UDEF triggers and runs, uh, runs rules. Uh, one of the problems was for a long time, um, U events were broadcast into all, uh, into all network namespaces. They are tied to Netlink, that's why they are tied to network namespaces, and they get yelled into all network namespaces. Um, the problem was the, the permissions these U events were sent out with, so the UID and GIDs, for example, were not fixed up relative to that user namespace, which basically meant that if you ran a thousand containers on your machine and uh, you had a, a, a cache event, like from a, a kernel cache event, slap, slop, slap. They are, I think slap is at least, which triggers U events, so you get U events for that. Or you created C groups or whatever, you got U events, and they got sent into all, into all network namespaces without being usable, because UDEV never saw them, even if you ran system containers in there with UDEV, actually. Because it just ignores U, uh, events from UIDs and GIDs uh, that are not UID or GID zero, which was pretty fun. So the first step we did is we implemented UDEF, uh, U event namespacing saying only network namespaces that are owned by the initial user namespace are able to receive U events and all of those that are not will not receive U events. But then we thought, hmm, actually there's a valid use case right now. What we allow you to do uh, with Lexi, for example, and Lexi is to inject devices into the container. You can inject USB devices and so on. Wouldn't it be cool if you could see U events inside of the container, run UDEF inside of the container, and then could trigger rules based on that? So what we did, and this is what U event injection means, is basically to allow you to forward U events uh, into a specific network namespace by adding a write method if you want it, if you want to call it like this, to the K object U event socket. Um, and so you can receive a U event on the host, you can strip the U event sequence number, you can relay it to the kernel, the kernel, kernel will append a new sequence number and make it visible inside of your unprivileged container, at which point UDEF will see the U event and then you can trigger, for example, running your USB rules or whatever you have. Black C comes with this by default. It's actually, this has been a pretty nifty feature actually. And at some point, if we think this is reasonable for other patch sets, we might enable it for them as well. Right, and this is a patch that uh, we're pretty excited about. This will land in the 5.0 kernel. Uh, so I talked about this uh, before briefly, or 
you might have gathered this from my talk. <laughs> User namespaces come with a bunch of limitations, including you cannot make not, you cannot mount any interesting file systems, and so on. Uh, and uh, the denials for this uh, are all essentially tied to the kernel. So the kernel, the kernel has a generic security policy saying, Mount uh, is not allowed for this type of file systems because security. But your container manager, for example, in this case, might have a much better idea of uh, when it should be safe to mount a file system or not. So, for example, if your container manager knows, oh, this device is specifically targeted to that container and it's totally safe to actually mount it, then you would like to defer the decision to the container manager instead to the kernel. And this is exactly what Second Trap to User Space allows you to do, which Tycho has done who sits in front right here. The guy in a sugar shirt who gave a talk before. Um, and so what you can essentially do is uh, you specify a second filter. Uh, and when uh, for interesting syscalls like make not or mount, let's use mount as, as an example. And then when the container uh, manager, when the container itself performs a mount, uh, the kernel will trap it. Uh, you can get an FD for, uh, for the container back. And from the FD, you can read interesting information about the syscall the container uh, now performed. And based on the information, the container manager can then instruct the kernel to say, either return back success or return back uh, failure, depending on whether or not it makes sense. Uh, and then the container manager itself can perform the operation for the container and then tell the kernel, report back success because I did this just for you. This is a very powerful mechanism, which is not just uh, interesting for container workloads or container managers. This is really interesting for a bunch of other stuff, in sandboxing just in general. And again, if you want to talk to the guy who did this and want to have more uh, information about how this actually is usable and so on, then you should talk to him. I feel like I should make you stand up. No, I'm joking. Um, all right, did I, have, did I miss anything? Okay. Uh, right. Uh, this is uh, work that is going, uh, going on currently. Uh, so there is a new mount API uh, going to be written uh, for the Linux kernel. Well, actually, it's in pretty decent shape. This is work done by uh, Elviro and uh, by uh, David Howells. Uh, this is pretty exciting, actually. Um, so the old mount API has a bunch of bugs which you might or might not be aware of. Um, the most severe one, for example, is under certain conditions, depending on, well, under certain conditions on remount, uh, the kernel will just silently ignore mount options. Um, so, for example, let's say you try to remount and you specify that the, the, this file system should be remounted with no SUID. Uh, but as I said, under certain conditions, the kernel will just uh, ignore the no SUID option. So you end up with a mount point that still supports uh, uh, set UID binaries, which can obviously be a security issue. This has been a long standing problem. Um, there is also uh, no way to recursively bind mount a, a whole mount tree read only, for example. It's actually a generic problem insofar as mount properties right now uh, are not applicable recursively. This has also caused a bunch of CDEs, actually. Um, and the new mount API tries to solve most or all of these uh, problems. There's obviously a long discussion going on, um, uh, but one of the other nice features about the mount API is it actually, mounting is a core concept in systems programming, Unix systems programming, and um, it, it's all done to one single syscall right now, which is just mount, and there's a bunch of mount options, there's a bunch of ways you can configure file systems and so on, uh, and by now it's probably not a, no, not a good idea anymore to just have one syscall for this, so what David Howells came up with, I assume it's David who came up with the idea, is okay, how about we split this into three distinct steps? These are more syscalls, but the concept is create a mount context, configure the mount context, and then commit to the mount, which is very Unixy, right? Open, you get an FD, you perform operations on the FD, and then you close the FD. So you, it's the same kind of model, which is, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, right, uh, so. You have the FS, uh, FS open syscall, which gives you basically creates a new FS context for a new superblock, then FS config, which you configures uh, the superblock with, and FS mount, you can commit to it. And there's a bunch of other syscalls as well. Uh, but yeah, but the mount API is something that has currently been worked on, and this is going to be pretty exciting, uh, I think. Um, another thing is uh, a friend of ours, uh, a good friend of mine, is working on Alexa is restricting path resolution. This has also been something that container runtimes have been plagued with in, in the face of symlinks and so on. It's 
pretty annoying to guarantee that users or that yeah that users cannot trick you into writing to a file or accessing a file uh, that you actually don't want them to access. This is there has a, have been a bunch of security bugs, especially in the face of mounts. So um, there was a prior patch set that had a similar idea. Uh, Alexa uh, picked up this patch set and extended it quite a bit. So the idea is you get new, new flags for the open and open ad call to restrict path resolution. So open ad allows you to specify a DRFD, and then you can give it a path relative to this DRFD, and then you can specify a bunch of flags, and depending on that, path resolution will, will work differently. So uh, the idea is to add a bunch more flags. OXDEV is you don't allow mount point crossing. So if, uh, if you specify a DRFD and something relative to that, and this would involve crossing a mount point, this is not possible anymore. Uh, oh no symlinks basically does what it says on the tin. It's no symlinks at all uh, allowed. Uh, there is a one special case called oh no magic links, which is proc uh, slash pit slash fd slash something. These are symlinks, magic symlinks, that can end up beaming you around on the file system, depending on where the file descriptor is coming from. So there's also a potential security issue. Uh, oh no magic symlinks would selectively allow you to block that. There is OBNEF, which guarantees that the DRFD file descriptor that you give to OpenAd uh, always, if you try to escape it, go up uh, above the DRFD, then you will get EPERM or EAccess or whatever the, the appropriate error for this case is. And oh, this route is uh, an interesting idea. It's basically crude without crude. Um, and the idea is you give it a DRFD and you give it another path, but this path, even if you try to go upwards, will always make you relative to the DRFD. So it will guarantee that you have to stick under the DRFD. Um, pretty cool idea. And uh, uh, last but not least, this is going to land in 5.0. This is work we did. There have been a bunch of users and use cases, don't ask me why, to run Android inside of containers, system containers. But the way uh, Android is structured, uh, it uses uh, the binder IPC mechanism um, and uh, it always grabs hold of a couple of binder devices when it boots up and the session man the manager will make it so that as soon as it has grabbed hold of these binder devices, you cannot reuse them in containers, meaning you need a way to dynamically allocate binder devices, um, which wasn't possible. So we came up with an idea, okay, let's write a tiny file system, which is an idea, well, it, afterwards I learned, it's actually an idea we, uh, we stole from KDBusFS. Uh, and uh, so this is a version of KDBusFS, if you want to put it like this. You can mount a new file system. It's mountable inside a user namespace. Uh, and uh, when it's mounted, you only have the binder-control device showing up in there. And then you can use this binder-control device to issue IOCTLs and the, similar to loop control, essentially, and say, give me a new binder device. So you can dynamically allocate as much binder devices as you want. You can have separate instances of binder-fs inside of all of your containers and so on. So you can run all the Android instances that you actually want inside of the container. This is upstream, uh, it's done, um, and it should be, yeah, it should be in, in 5.0, unless Linus decides to revert it because he hates me, I don't know. Um, and last but not least, this is something we are currently working on, or I am currently working on, um, is uh, file descriptors for processes. This is obviously not something that is a completely new and crazy idea. This has been done in FreeBSD for, sorry, this has been done uh, by FreeBSD for a while now. Um, we want something similar for Linux. Um, uh, basically, at some point, ending up with a whole file descriptor-based uh, API for processes. Um, and why do we want this? Well, uh, the first patch set that, is, that I'm going to send is a pull request for, five point, for the 5.1 merge window, because we're in v7 now, and most people have acted uh, that think it's a good idea. Um, think about the kill, uh, the kill uh, syscall. Um, the way uh, PID allocation in Linux works, so the, the process identify allocation works, is that it's cyclic, and usually the limit is set to 33,000. Uh, 33, so that's the highest PID, F, PID uh, identifier that you can actually get. Um, and it, it only wraps around, it only wraps around when all of the PIDs have been at least once allocated, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you're on a system that is under heavy load, so there's a lot of processes being created and going and exiting and so on, so you can end up in a scenario where your PID gets recycled. And if this happens behind your back and you try to send a signal to a PID that has been recycled, you might end up selling, sending sick kill to a process that you really didn't want to send sick kill to. It's been a long-standing problem. So one of the ideas is 
yes, let's use file descriptors for processes. Let's use something that basically pins struct pid inside of the kernel instead of struct task so you don't waste a lot of memory. The way you can do this is you get a file descriptor from slash proc slash pid and uh, this is by design already pinning struct uh, pid inside of the kernel. So what happens now is if you try to signal a process that has exited behind your back through this pid of D, uh, you get no such process, which also means you can use the syscall to test for the existence of processes and so on if you send it signal zero and you get uh, no such process back, you know that it has exited behind your back. If, you get, if it succeeds, it's either a zombie or it's still alive. Uh, so it has a bunch of nice, there's a bunch of nice features uh, that a pit of D-based uh, API can give you. Um, yeah. I think that's mostly it, what I wanted to cover at this point. I mean, I can, sh we don't have a lot of time, so I could give you a few demos, but it's probably not worth it. It's rather I stop here and let you ask a bunch of questions about the stuff we did. Uh, Taiko? Uh, one of the problems I always have with mount is that if I do something wrong, I just get a inval and I have no idea what happened. Um, I saw here you have a FS config and there's um, you know key and a value, but presumably that's just building up the same mount option string that it ultimately passes to the file system to parse the super blocks, or has he lifted all that code out so I'll get inval at config time instead of at mount time? You probably get e inval at config time, but also uh, uh, along with the mount API. I don't. It's probably along is, with. Is I mean, are you, have you looked at that, or because you have to refactor every file system, right? That's what they are doing. Like they're switching this over to this f context stuff. They have to do okay. it anyway. So that's still, that's you can look in the kernel tree. You can verify in the kernel tree. But what he's also doing is, uh, uh, I talked to David about this. Uh, he said, yeah, this is something that upset him as well. And there is a notif there is a notification, basically a notification mechanism built into this mount API, if I remember it correctly, uh, that would give you informative error messages when something goes wrong. Cool. Other questions? Can we expect something uh, like uh, audit logging inside the namespaces? Sorry, what? Uh, something like uh, audit logging. Uh, audit uh, logging inside audit the namespaces. Logging, yeah. uh, uh, are, you, are you asking uh, uh, for if we have basically audit trails for containers? Yep. Ugh. Uh, I mean, this, this is the whole audit ID discussion that has been going on upstream. That's a yeah, if I, it's not definitely per container. It's going to be a bit abstracted, right? In the sense that you have a random identifier that you, at least that's I, how I understood it. I didn't follow that patch sets uh, too closely. You have a random identifier you can assign to whatever you consider a container, and then you will get an audit trail uh, tied to that. Uh, the problem is containers are not a kernel thing. It's basically just a user space thing. Also, again, David Howells would disagree. I have seen his patch set. He has to, added two syscalls as a proof of concept to basically make containers a kernel thing. Any other question? All right. Well, thank you. <laughs>